Welcome back, everybody, to the Locked On Pirates podcast. I am, of course, your host who does the most, Ethan Smith. Hope you all are having a phenomenal Wednesday, August 31st. Tomorrow is September 1st, so I will be keeping a look at everything this evening and tomorrow morning in terms of September call-ups, so we'll see how that all goes. I did start recording today's episode at the bottom of the seventh inning where the Pittsburgh Pirates are trailing the Milwaukee Brewers 5-1, to one, so or 4-1, to one, so it appears that the Pirates will lose a season series to a Milwaukee Brewers team that they shouldn't have. But on today's episode, it is Wednesday, which means it's Mailbag Wednesday, which also means I'm going to be answering your questions about the Pittsburgh Pirates and anything else under the umbrella of the Pittsburgh Pirates while also recapping this series and talking about some topics you guys want to hear. Today's episode is brought to you by Bet Online with college football returning this weekend. Make sure you use betonline.net for all of your betting needs this weekend. More on them later. But with that said, guys, let's get into today's episode. You are Locked On Pirates, your daily Pittsburgh Pirates podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Welcome back to the Locked On Pirates podcast, everybody. I am, of course, your host, who does the most, Ethan Smith. Hope you guys, again, are all having a phenomenal last day of August here on Wednesday, August 31st, where the Pittsburgh Pirates are wrapping up their series against the Milwaukee Brewers, in which they got a win last night, and a big win at that. And since it's Mailbag Wednesday, we're going to get right into some stuff that we saw last night from Quest Glove. Are we finally seeing the Mitch Keller we all thought he'd be this season? He's posting a 3.7 ERA in his last 15 starts, had 10 strikeouts last night. I'm absolutely loving this turn for him. And my answer to you is yes. I think this is where Mitch Keller is finally turning the dial on his career. Of course, former top 100 prospect. We know the whole drill. He struggled the first couple years in the majors, but this year, he even came in and he didn't start all that great. He didn't start like with the light on fire. And even a 3.7 ERA over his last 15 starts is not absolutely setting the world on fire, but it's much, much, much better than what we have seen from Mitch Keller in the past. And there's a reason that I say that because this pitching or this pitching staff right now is not good. It's not good at all. So seeing the likes of Rowanti Contreras and Mitch Keller and even Zach Thompson today, who had a pretty good run of things in those first four innings, having five strikeouts and only three hits allowed, you take these when you get them. You take these moments. You take these outings. You take these starts when you get them. You take, for instance, the relief pitching when they have good outings. You take what you can get from these guys, and there's a reason that you do that because it's what you're working with right now. I've stated on this podcast and will continue to state on this podcast that the Pirates' biggest need this offseason is figuring out starting pitching and relief pitching. They're going to have to do it. Now, with David Bednar being out, the relief pitching right now has gotten kind of a rough shake of things. It's kind of been a little eh in that department because David Bednar is not there to close things down. You don't really have a major closer. So that even puts more onus on what the starting pitchers need to do. And Mitch Keller, as you mentioned, even with that ERA and the 10 K's that he had last night over his last 15 starts, he's been striking guys out a lot more. You need that from Mitch Keller right now because of the state of your bullpen. You need your starters to come in like Rowanzi, like Keller, like Thompson, like uh, Brubaker, who congratulations on the birth of his child with his wonderful wife. You need these guys to consistently give you five or six innings. Right now, Contreras and Keller are doing that for you, and that's why I think those guys are going to continue to be staples in that starting rotation for a while. If you had to ask me, in a perfect world, Rowanzi and Keller would be the two guys left in the rotation, and they would make three signings in the offseason or bring up a guy like Michael Burrows who can potentially make an impact on the starting uh, rotation. Zach Thompson right now showed out today, 
He hasn't been terrible, but he hasn't been good either. So he's like right in that spot of mediocre. JT Brubaker has never really escalated into anything crazy as the starter, but he has been reliable over the last couple of years. And then you're looking at other pieces like Tyler Beatty. He's a relief arm. I don't care. That's a bullpen game thing. Bryce Wilson, you saw him this season struggle. I don't I don't see him being a part of the starting rotation that much longer either. I think his best role would be what Will Crow's role has molded into, which is long relief. So we will see how this continues to move forward. But this is the best case scenario the Pirates could have hoped for with Mitch Keller is that he made obvious progression from throwing 100 miles per hour in the offseason and everybody absolutely losing their mind to developing a good pitch in his sinker and other complementary pitches that are not only getting guys out, but striking guys out. That to me has been the biggest thing is that they're striking guys out on these pitches with Keller. Now his placement has been better. His command has been better. His velocity has been better. He's allowing less hard contact. I'm liking it a lot. Let's just hope that he continues to move on this trajectory. Speaking of pitching from last night, Gavin comes in with a question. Is Chase DeYoung elite, or is he just getting lucky innings in relief? This one is a little bit harder to answer, just because I do think that Chase DeYoung has performed well, but he has had his moments of hard contact allowed that have not exactly been very welcoming to what the Pirates are wanting out of a relief arm right now. Now, when you look at what his stats are, which you guys know, I'm a big stats guy at the end of the day, stats are what matter. He has a 1.95 ERA this year in 55 innings with a point uh, nine, six whip over his last 30 games. That ERA is a 1.95, which is over those 55 innings. But even over his last seven, 16 innings, seven outings, 14 strikeouts. The kid has done good. I mean, he's averaging two strikeouts every appearance that he comes into games. I mean, you saw him last night in Milwaukee, uh, one and two-thirds innings. You saw him in Philly the other day with two uh, uh, three innings pitched and two hits. And then against Atlanta, two and one-thirds with one hit. Maybe Chase DeYoung can start filling in the gap when the starting pitchers don't go very deep with a good complimentary two or three innings of work. Chase DeYoung is one of those guys that can do that. He can go those multiple innings against these very tough lineups, get strikeouts, get outs, limit the hits, get out of it unscathed. Not every relief pitcher on the staff is that. That's why I can't stand when they throw guys like Dylan Peters out there for multiple innings or Dwayne Underwood out there for multiple innings. Not everybody on the staff is meant to be a guy who's going to go two or three innings. That's what you have guys like Will Crow for. That's what you have guys like Tyler Beatty for. That's what you have guys like Chase DeYoung for. Chase DeYoung, I think, has a potential to be a piece in this bullpen for a while. Is he something that's going to make this bullpen exponentially better? I don't think so. But you have to consider, if he's limiting the amount of runs that he's giving up, striking guys out, He has allowed some hard contact, but for the most part, that hard contact has not resulted in runs. If he's doing all that stuff, I'm not going to sit here and say he's a lead, obviously. I know you're joking, but he's been good. And if you say otherwise, I mean, you could go look at the contact that he's giving up. But other than that, I've enjoyed what I've seen from him. I think that he's doing phenomenal. I like it a lot. And I do really think that the young could be a potential piece in this bullpen for a while. I don't know how long a while is. A while for me could be six months. It could be three years. Who knows? It just all depends on if he continues to produce out of the bullpen in those multiple faceted innings and in this long relief role. That's what it'll all come down to. And if he continues to keep the ERA below a two, I don't see how you don't use him. Personally. But the future will foretell what Chase DeYoung entails for the bullpen. Today's episode, by the way, is brought to you by the wonderful people over at betonline.net. The best place to do all of your sports betting. I mean, the Pirates are in action this weekend. Penn State is in action tomorrow. Pitt 
is in action tomorrow against West Virginia. You got some big college football games, Georgia versus Oregon, Ohio State and Notre Dame, Arkansas, Cincinnati, Utah, Florida, Florida State, LSU. You got college football all the way through Labor Day. So it's going to be a very, very, very fun time here with Bet Online, where you can make some really good money on some of these games. BetOnline.net is your number one source for all of your pro and college football betting needs and sports info this season. Find all the latest football league developments, game matchups, news, and podcasts, including this year's opening week games. BetOnline is also your continued source for all of your sporting wagering information, including live betting, esports, and scores. The fastest and easiest way to check in on all of your favorite sports and events, including MLB, MMA, boxing, and golf. So head to the website today or use your mobile device to learn more about the trends and action. And you already know, BetOnline, it's where the game starts. So we're continuing Mailbag Wednesday. And, you know, we got to talk about some other stuff that you guys wanted to talk about as we go to the Queen. Pirates Queen Banshee says, it's nice to see Sawinski's back, but I wasn't expecting to see him again until mid-September. What do you think the Pirates saw that facilitated the move back to the majors, just plugging a hole? Or is it as simple as service time and letting him work things out here? Now, it was funny. Because I was on a call with a lot of the uh, the people in the network uh, as a daily meeting that we do or whatever. And I brought up that Sawinski was back to Lindsey Crosby of Locked on MLB Prospects. Shockingly, Jack Sawinski still leads all NL, all, uh, NL rookies in home runs with 14. He was doing some of that in AAA. But before his call-up, he had 64 at-bats prior to his call-up, right? This is over a certain amount of days. This is not the total amount of bats that he had. In those 64 at-bats, Jack Sawinski had 25 strikeouts. So I'm here to tell you, I don't think it was a matter of his performance. I think it was more a matter of the guy who got sent down in the performance he was having. And I'm talking about Bly Madris who was just not doing much of anything for this Pirates team. He was a cool story. He finally got to the majors. He had a great debut. He just wasn't getting it done. I mean, the guy was batting well below the Mendoza line. He had no power element to him. He was offering nothing defensively. So then you go to Jack Sawinski here, and he at least offers you a power element, albeit he strikes out a lot. But that's most guys who are power-centric. But he's also very good defensively. I mean, you saw the defensive play he had out of left field last night. He's a good asset defensively in left field or right field, or if they eventually flirt with the idea of putting him at first base. So not only does Suwitzki struggle with the bat, but he does something that Bly Madris doesn't, which is play strong defense and also hit the occasional home run once a week. Of course, Jack Sawinski hasn't done that yet since he's been called back up, but he's been up here for two games. So I don't think that's going to mean too much. But if you had to ask me, Queen Banshi, I would really think that it was just a matter of Bly Madris's play and the fact that he just wasn't really offering this team anything. Jack Sawinski at least offers this team something that they're looking for, which is that power element. And I think that eventually... Hopefully, he does figure it out. As a score update, by the way, it's still 5-1 Milwaukee in the bottom of the seventh. I have I, I kind of expected this to happen. But, you know, Jack Sawinski, again, just a rare case of can he figure out plate discipline and can he figure out how to limit the strikeout ball? If he could stop striking out as much, Pirates found a diamond in the rough. I'm going to be honest with you the way he was hitting the baseball before he got sent down. There's a lot to like about Jack Sawinski, except the strikeouts. They can live with it with O'Neill Cruz. Can they live with it with Jack Sawinski? Speaking of O'Neill Cruz, uh, Pitt Panther, love this guy. Should O'Neill Cruz look into buying the Brew Crew? 
Not sure it's necessary since he basically already owns them. Well, yes, uh, this is something that has been very interesting to keep a look at, especially after his home run against Corbin Burns on Monday. He had a good game last night as well with the uh, game-winning double play with Castro and Cruz, which is very wholesome because he spoke with Alex Stump of uh, DK's Pittsburgh Sports before the season started in spring training, saying all he wanted to do was turn a double play with his best friend, Rodolfo Castro, at the big league level. He got to do it with the rocket arm that he possesses, uh, possesses. He just plays well against the Brewers. I, I don't know what it is. He's homered off of Corbin Burns twice this year. Six of his 11 home runs are against the Brewers. 13 of his 34 RBIs are against the Brewers. I believe that number went up from 14, uh, 13 to 14. Maybe O'Neill Cruz just likes playing against the Brewers. Uh, Andrew McCutcheon was a big component of, of really liking playing the Reds. That was just what he liked doing. There's players like that all the time across these division rivalries. You see it with Colton Wong. He loves destroying the Pirates wherever he may be, be it St. Louis or be it Milwaukee. He likes to just wreck teams. I mean, you saw it with um, Cincinnati last year. Pretty much their whole team liked just absolutely going crazy against the Pittsburgh Pirates. I mean, it's just how it is. So if it means that O'Neill Cruz can find that, that little mental part of his brain that he gets to when he plays Milwaukee against other teams look out but Pitt Panther also had another question what are spots you'd like to see the team upgrade through trade slash free agency it's easy to say that we want to upgrade right field but that would mean blocking Swaggerty, Kanan Smith and Jigba, Cal Mitchell etc and I'm not sure that would be worth it I think first base and starting pitching make the most sense but not sure there are many impact first basemen available again as I answer the questions about free agency, we are nearing the end of the year. Once the season ends, I will be doing player grades and all of that stuff and taking a look at how everybody did this year. And then we're going to take a deep dive look at free agency while the playoffs are going on to kind of give you guys an idea of who the Pirates could be looking at and at the power positions. I'm not even really sure who's at first base. Starting pitching is always very different. The only thing I really know going into this offseason is there's a lot of high-profile free agents with player options and arbitration eligibility. So we'll see how that all gets taken care of. But I agree with you about the outfield thing. And I also want to throw out here that Gary, uh, Gary our wonderful guest usually on Mondays, uh, he will be on this upcoming Tuesday uh, we're taking Labor Day off here at Locked On Pirates, so we will be coming to you on Tuesday. So think of that Gary Morgan Monday is a or two on Tuesday as a Gary Morgan Monday. But he also said that he had a piece on Bucks in the Basement. Go check that out. Sure, that'll lay some light. But I do agree with you that first base and starting pitching are probably the two biggest needs for this Pittsburgh Pirates team. And there's a multitude of reasons why. I mean, starting pitching, you it's kind of self-explanatory. You could just look at the starting pitching staff and see why they need to upgrade at the position. First base, on the other hand, Michael Chavis has had his moments. He just doesn't perform that well against right-handed pitching, so I would like to see them get a solid platoon guy over there. One guy who came to mind, and I don't know if he was re-signed already, is Jerickson Profar because, one, he's a switch-hitting utility guy. That's something I'd love the Pirates to flirt with. Josh Bell, I'm pretty sure, will probably say in San Diego, but I would more than welcome a return to the Pittsburgh Pirates from Josh Bell. I think trading him was the right move when they did do it, but his services would be very, very important right now as not only a good first baseman, but a good sw uh, switch hitting first baseman, or even as a switch hitting DH, which you might already have in Rodolfo Castro. But going back to the other part of your question, where you mentioned about um, upgrading the outfield, I do think the Pirates as of right now, have enough options to where they do not need to sign a guy. I mean, you're talking about Jack Sawinski, as you mentioned, Swaggerty, Kanan Smith and Jigba, Cal Mitchell. You've got to keep in mind that Matt Frazier will probably get a shot up here next year. Um, Connor Scott will probably get a shot up here next year. So there's a lot of outfielders that are going to be at the Pirates' disposal that they need to get a real look on. But then at some point, if you're starting to notice that these guys are just not going to be worth it, which they've even flirted with throwing Tucapito Marcano in the outfield, which I don't actually mind too much. 
once you see what you have, then I think that's where you can get into the uh, idea of upgrading. But I definitely think you're spot on with it. I do think first base is where they need to upgrade them. Uh, up first base and starting pitching along with relief pitching. Pitching in general and first base are the two needs that this team will have. And I mean, don't go out there and sign some guy you're just going to trade by July. I'm talking sign some guys that could be here for the foreseeable future and make this team 10 times better. Um, and then a final question that we uh, also received here today. I believe that might actually be all of the questions, but I also have a jinx, by the way, uh, if you guys didn't notice on today's uh, Twitter stuff. But as we take a look at the Pirates here, let's see if they finally got out of the bottom of the seventh. They did not. It's still six to one Brewers now in the bottom of the seventh with two outs. But we'll take a look at um, what the road ahead lies for. We're going to have a whole episode tomorrow previewing the series against the Tampa Bay Blue or the Tampa Bay Blue Jays, Jesus, the Toronto Blue Jays, who are going to be heavily favored heading into the series. If you guys did not know about myself, the Toronto Blue Jays are actually my favorite American League team. So I am rooting for them to get back into the postseason. Of course, we all know their stars, Vladimir Guerrero Jr., Alec Manoa, George Springer, Lourdes Goriel Jr., Bo Bichette, Alejandro Kirk. The list goes on and on and on. They are 70 and 58 right now. So this is just a quick look at them. They are, they possess a three-game lead on Minnesota and uh, Baltimore for the wild card spots. Of course, Tampa Bay, Seattle, and Toronto as the three wild card teams is very, very, very scary, I think, for a lot of the American League. But, uh, of course, Alec Manoa will be on the mound tomorrow for the Blue Jays. On Friday, it'll be Ross Stripling against Rowanzi Contreras. And then on Sunday, which is going to be on Peacock, it'll be Bryce Wilson versus Jose Barrios. So a series that I don't expect the Pirates to do too well in, but it really all depends on one central thing that I know about the Blue Jays from watching some of their games. If the offense doesn't produce and the starting pitching, I'm sure probably will, things are going to get dicey. And then if you keep looking at the road ahead, Daniel Vogelbach will make his return to PNC Park as a New York Met as the Mets travel to Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh then hosts uh, the Cardinals in this long road stand. And then they will play five games in four or four games in three days against the Cincinnati Reds before the Mets, the Yankees, the Cubs, the Reds, and then the Cardinals wrap up their season. So we're getting... Down the home stretch, guys. Things are getting to the point where September call-ups are going to be here tomorrow. The Pittsburgh Pirates are wrapping up their season. They're obviously not playoff contenders, and we will start looking towards 2023. Thank you guys for all putting in some wonderful questions, as you always do here on the Locked On Pirates podcast. My name is Ethan Smith. Of course, we will be back tomorrow previewing this Toronto Blue Jays series and talking about anything else that goes on in the world of the Pittsburgh Pirates, including the September call-ups period. Guys, with that said, enjoy the last day of August. I will see you in September. <laughs> and thank you guys so much and have a wonderful rest of your evening.